Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up AA Lab. Well, here we are, episode number four in my series on this simple radio receiver. And today's topic, it's all about software. I'll go through my thought processes before I started writing the code, demonstrate a couple of methods I created to make the coding process easier, and finish with a demonstration of the fully functional software. Even though the Arduino is new to me, this isn't my first rodeo writing software. In fact, I've been an amateur coder for decades, writing things in C, C++, Visual Basic, PHP, even Pascal back in the day. In fact, my first programming experience was on the Commodore VIC-20. Here's me as a teenager working away on my VIC-20 shortly after I got it. I didn't have the cash at that time for a color monitor or even a color TV, so I made do with a black and white TV for a year or so. But eventually I progressed to the point where I even managed to start a small side business to sell some of my original VIC-20 programs on cassette tapes out of my parents' house. But that was a short-lived adventure. If I remember rightly, I don't think I sold more than a dozen copies of my programs. I guess Bill Gates had something that I didn't. Anyway, the relevant point from that short flashback is I'm familiar with writing code in the limited memory space. For those of us who've worked in the VIC-20, you remember it only has 3,583 bytes of RAM. So you learn pretty quickly about how to be efficient with your code, or if you couldn't, well, you went and sprung for some very expensive memory expansion modules. So 30K of flash and 2K of RAM seems like a luxury compared to what was on the VIC-20. But nevertheless, even today, I'm still a bit obsessed about making code as lean and small and as efficient as possible. I get a little crazy when I go to download some new app or program nowadays and see just how huge it is. Not to pick on anything in particular, but I guess I will. Um, have you looked at how big the Adobe Acrobat Reader download is anymore? It's over 300 megabytes. When it first came out, I'm going to date myself here a little bit, I can remember it was maybe 9, 10, 12, 15 megabytes, something around that size, and that was its advantage. It was lean and small. Does it do anything better today than it did 20 years ago? Okay, I'm done monologuing about Adobe Acrobat. Let's take a look at the software. The first task before typing up any code is to decide on the software requirements. Things like, what hardware will the Nano need to control and by what interfaces? What inputs will come back to it from the hardware and from user controls, and again, by what interfaces? What features should it have? And of course, what do I want the visual interface to look like? If this were a work project, I'd be documenting all of this information in a formal statement of requirements, but for a simple project like this, a few slides and spreadsheet notes are just fine. Let's begin with the hardware the Arduino will control. There's the 1.8 inch display in the Max 4820, both of which will be using the SPI interface. It will also control the SI5351 clock generator via the I2C interface. Next up are the inputs to the Arduino, both from the hardware and user controls. I've got two rotary encoders providing digital inputs from the user. Next is the analog data coming from the three bandpass filter banks, which will tell the Arduino the type of filter in each of the three banks. And lastly is a signal from the AGC circuit, which will be used for the virtual S-meter display. With the hardware defined, I can now assign the various nano input and output pins to those interfaces, and here's what that assignment looks like. No surprises here, I've used every open digital and analog pin, with the exception of D0 and D1, which, like a lot of folks, I'm too chicken to mess with. There's nothing groundbreaking with what I've done here. The items that need SPI and I2C interfaces are connected to the usual pins. I've got encoder number one connected to D2 and D3, so I can read it via an interrupt. On the analog side, I did have to make sure not to assign digital outputs to A6 or A7, but other than that, the rest fell into place as shown. Simultaneous with the pin assignments, I've also made a list of all the user controllable functions. Because I've got the schematic already done, most of these fall right into place, especially those that have standalone controls like the audio volume and all the trimmer pots. What's most relevant here is to decide how to assign the functions to the two encoders. Recall from the interface slide I called them control number one and control number two. Thinking through these assignments is not trivial. 
the decisions you make here will drive how you have to structure the code. In coder number one, I decided we'll handle changes in frequency and switching between the two virtual VFOs, and the second encoder will handle all of the menu functions. Note that the second encoder also drives a state machine in the program. And that's what I'm showing here. I'm pretty sure this isn't formatted the way a professional programmer would draw a state diagram, but in any case, my reasoning and content are valid, even if my format is a bit funky. There are five states in the machine. Each state corresponds to a menu mode such as adjust tune step, adjust band, and so on. Inputs to the states are the obvious ones like clockwise and counterclockwise encoder rotations and the encoder push button. Rotating the encoder drives the usual actions like increment or decrement a parameter. Pushing the encoder button changes to the next state in the sequence. Note that I also included a timer expire input to all but one of the states. I'm using a timer to force the menu back to the adjust tuning step state because I see that as the most commonly needed menu command. So for example, if you are in the adjust band state, after so many seconds of no input from you, the state machine will revert back to the adjust tune step state. With that done, I started writing the actual code. Skipping over all the hours of writing and testing and revising, here's what I guess I should call the beta level code, meaning it has all of the required features and I've tested it enough to prove it's working as intended, but just needs final debugging. You can slow this down and study it to your heart's content if you want, and I'm sure my fellow programmers will find things to criticize. I don't mind. Every coder hates every other coder's code, or so I've heard. While it's scrolling, I'll talk about a couple highlights. I do have several to-dos in there, places where I've either overridden the default behavior until I have all the hardware assembled, or to keep a reminder for future improvements. The loop function does only three things. It manages the state machine, it manages the timer, and it updates the S-meter bar graph. All of that can be done very quickly so that the S-meter is refreshed as fast as possible to limit it from stuttering. Lastly, in the interrupt handler, all that I'm doing is setting a global variable to reflect the rotation direction. All other actions are handled outside the interrupt to keep the program from stalling, or worse, locking up. Moving on now, one of the most time-consuming portions of the coding process was creating the graphics display subroutines. The commands themselves are simple, the complexity is in coming up with an artistic design, and then converting that art into drawing commands. So what I developed was a technique using PowerPoint that lets me easily try out ideas to scale and quickly make changes. Using simple primitive shapes and moving them around and stretching them until I was satisfied, I developed the final concept that I'm showing here. I then could interrogate each shape for its X and Y coordinates and its size, and then use that data for the draw commands. I've made a separate tutorial video on the details of how I did this. I'll include a link to it in the description. Note that for the frequency display, I'm using large numerals for the first five digits. I tried drawing them using the standard font, but that was just too blocky. I also looked at including a font file. That was problematic for two reasons. First, I just didn't like any of the Adafruit GFX fonts that come with a library. Second, and most significantly, including a font file consumes a lot of flash memory. As an example, this font here was the closest to what I wanted, but including it and printing the frequency claimed 2,744 bytes of flash. Not very efficient, considering that I only need 10 characters to cover the digits 0 through 9, and not the entire character set. So instead, I made my own bitmap files for the 10 digits. I then used the draw bitmap command in the GFX library to put them on the screen. I sized the characters to 24 pixels wide by 32 pixels high. That means each character is 96 bytes, so 960 bytes then for all 10. I needed a few more steps in my code to draw them on the screen, but even so, I'm using around 1K of flash instead of the 2.7K the font wanted, so that's a big savings. I've made a short tutorial video for this process as well, and I've also linked it in the description. All right, I'm down in the workshop and I put together this breadboard of all the digital content for the receiver. And I've got two cameras going, my uh, Sony to get kind of the shot here on the left. And I've also got my uh, 
older camcorder, it's also a Sony, um, set up to look at this Christmas tree effective LEDs. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But going through what I put together, I wanted to make sure that uh, certainly all of the pin assignments that I chose for the Arduino were going to work as intended. So I've got the Nano here, of course, on the display. And that is the actual dis uh, display design that I'm intending and in using. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. I'll do a different camera shot and zoom in on that. Uh, of course, I got the SI5351 set up, and I have my very simple frequency counter kind of clamped um, oddly at the side of the bench, but hopefully you can see that coming through fine. I've also got the two encoders, of course, the frequency encoder and the menu encoder. And then I've also have this potentiometer here to simulate the S meter input, and you can see that going up and down and refreshing nice and quick. So that, of course, will come from the AGC circuit in the actual radio, but I'm just simulating it. And I mentioned this Christmas tree of LEDs. So what I've done here, I wanted to make sure that the portion of the circuit that uses the MAX 4820, and I'll put this on camera, uh, hopefully it'll come through, but if not, you can go back to the prior video and see this section on the four relays that are controlling the three bandpass filters. So I have set this up and just did a very simple red and green LED um, uh, system here connected to the relay contact so I could verify that as I switch bands that I'm actually getting the bank zero, bank one, and bank two combinations like I expected. So this little note here is the truth table. Right now we're in bank zero and I would expect uh, starting with K1 at the bottom and going up to K4 at the top that this should be red, red, and this is actually don't care, don't care because K3 and K4 are not used in bank zero. So going over to the mode switch and change the uh, bank, you can see that I've now changed to bank one. So I've got, I expect green, green, red, red, and green, green, red, red is what I've got. And hopefully on the video onto to the side, that actually shows up a little more clearly. You probably also noticed this classic uh, ammeter I've got here. I put that up there in purpose just to make sure that I didn't end up with a logic error that caused me to have a stuck relay. If you remember in my prior video, I'm using that Max 4820 to drive these latching relays, and I just want to pulse the current and switch them from state to state. Now, I did change the software temporarily to go from 10 milliseconds per pulse to 100, just so it would be a little more noticeable for this troubleshooting. So right now, we're at uh, bank zero, and I can go back to the mode switch and change it to uh, bank two, and that should be green, 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 and we got all greens across the board, so that's working well. I moved the camera in closer so we can get a better look at both the display and my frequency counter. Now, I do have one bug in the software. As I turn the encoder clockwise, the frequency is going down. So that's a simple thing to fix. But the key thing is I did prove that I've got the I squared C interface working correctly. I'm commanding the SI5351 correctly and getting a frequency output that changes with my commands from software. Now I do have to put the offset in there for the uh, first mixer frequency. I have to off this, offset this by about nine megahertz and I will do that eventually. But this is the key moment to make sure that it's actually working. Okay, for this final shot, what I've done is I've turned off the workshop lights to give the display a bit uh, brighter contrast and of course zoomed in on it so we can see it better. And I'll just walk through the software and show some of the other features that I've implemented. Now the first one, the most obvious one I've demonstrated already, that's the frequency change from the frequency encoder. And I've also got a VFO A and VFO B function by just using the push button and then storing of course in memory what the two different frequencies are going to be. Um, the menu encoder Coder. So I started showing that a bit with the bandpass filter selection. Its default mode is the frequency tune step. So right now I'm at 100 kilohertz and I can dial that all the way down to a single hertz. Not sure if that's going to be entirely useful or not, but it's easy enough to do in software. Probably going to keep it at probably one kilohertz most of the time. Now cycling through the menu after the frequency tune step is the select band feature, of course, and we just saw that already. When you um, uh, turn the encoder, you switch between bank zero, bank one, and bank two, the band pass filters. And if you look carefully, that select band just flashed and changed back to frequency tune step. 
that's the timer I mentioned in the state machine that after, right now it's set for uh, five seconds, it'll switch back to the frequency tune step because I think that's going to be the most useful uh, mode for that encoder. So if you keep pressing the button and go past select band, you get to receive mode and you can switch between upper side band, lower side band, and CW. Not exactly sure how I'm going to implement the CW function other than it's going to be very similar to USB in terms of the frequency offset for the BF, uh, BFO, but nonetheless I included it. And then uh, pushing the encoder to get us back to the mode, the menu mode uh, brightness. That's a, a, a one that's probably going to be useful to dial up and down the screen brightness and of course this display supports a PWM modulated signal to change the brightness so that was easy to implement and then the last one just for the heck of it I put in different colors for the frequency display so that's it nice lovely purple I can leave it at and then uh, I did skip over the um, S meter we can take a closer look at that again I'm driving that with just a potentiometer right now but that'll come from the AGC circuit once I have everything connected up so that's what it looks like I think it looks pretty good for the five large digits you might not have noticed this but when I adjusted the frequency only the ones that needed to change were redrawn my original code redrew all five digits and that caused a very noticeable flicker. Here's what that flicker looked like in super slow-mo. Yep, I learned how to use my Sony ZV-1 to capture this. You can see each digit getting redrawn. And that makes sense. The Atmega 328 processor and the ST7735R driver on the display don't double buffer. And the redraw time for that much of the screen is visible to the human eye. The last item I want to cover in this software episode is the size of my program. Remember that I said that I'm a bit obsessed about writing efficient code? And that I said I'd use best practices to minimize the flash and RAM requirements of my program? So how did I do? Let's take a look at these charts. Per the specs, I started with the 30,720 bytes of flash and 2,048 bytes of RAM. Putting in the empty shells of the setup and loop functions take 444 and 9 right off the top. My code, minus any library references and commenting out all calls to those libraries, comes in at a petite 2116 bytes of flash and 64 bytes of RAM. Not too shabby, that's only about 7% of the flash space. But the elephant in the room, or more precisely the elephant in the flash, is the Adafruit GFX library and my associated calls to it. That takes well over half the space. Now clearly, there's a lot in that library beyond what I'm using, and I find it hard to believe that the linker isn't compiling a lot of unnecessary baggage. For sure, something stinks here, and I would think a clever programmer could make a much smaller version that strips out unused functions. Moving on, the rest of the libraries don't have much of an impact. But I do want to mention Pavel Milani's modified SI5351 library that I'm using here. The standard library was over 10k in flash and just would not fit with everything else. But Pavel's optimized library fits just fine and even has a few performance improvements. So in the end I've got about 28% of the flash free and 65% of the RAM free. Not too shabby. Now a word of caution here. I don't think the Arduino IDE calculates the flash and RAM consumption consistently. I've done some experiments and can show it gives inconsistent results. Also, I don't think these totals accurately include my added graphics header memory, so worst case add an additional 1K of flash to my code total. Anyway, we only have what the IDE tells us, so that's what I'm reporting here. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this fourth episode in the series all about software. And in episode five, it's back to the hardware. And here's a little preview. I'll try to get this to focus on the camera, but here is the audio board. And this is my own uh, creation. I made this board and just finished populating it yesterday. And I'll be trying it out over the next day or two to make sure it's working correctly. So look for that in episode five. So until next time, bye for now.